And there are many commentaries. This book is so important. And, and Muhammad Lahiji, who is one of the great commentators, he writes the following on the line I just recited to you. He says, if a Muslim who affirms the unity of God as a condition of the faith were aware of the truth about the Buddha and aware of the supreme reality that manifests through the form of the Buddha, he would know there is true faith in its veneration. This is because it is absolute being, which is the supreme reality, which is manifesting in the Buddha statue. Thus, the Buddha is actually the supreme reality. And true faith in Islamic practice is in worshiping the supreme reality. Thus, venerating the Buddha statue is the same as worshiping the supreme reality. So there is certainly true faith in Buddha veneration. Now, who would have expected that from an Islamic writer? Next line by Shabastari. If the idolater realized the truth about the Buddha statue, how could he have gone astray in his worship? Now, remember, the idolater is the person who actually is expecting something from the statue itself, which I guess if you melted it, you might get something. But you see, the person is actually expecting the statue to deliver. And, uh, and, he, and, and the Lahiji, the commentator, says, if the polytheist who venerates the Buddha were aware of the reality inherent in the statue and knew that the Buddha statue was a manifestation of the supreme reality and that the supreme reality revealed itself through it, and if the idolater prostrated before the Buddha to worship it for this reason, how could he have gone astray in his faith and religion? Shabastari's next line is, the idolater sees only the form of the Buddha statue, which makes him a heretic according to Islamic law. But now you're going to see what he's on to here in a moment. Because he says, Lahiji says, the idolater hasn't seen anything but the outer form, meaning the particular delimited outer form of the Buddha. And it is precisely because his vision is restricted to the outer form of the Buddha that he is called an idolater, as defined by pro prophetic revelation. Yet if the worshiper of the Buddha had observed the manifestation of the supreme reality in the outer form of the statue, he could not in Islamic orthodoxy be an idolater he would be regarded as an orthodox Muslim. You see the distinction, huh? So the, 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 the Buddhist who venerates the Buddha because of its inherent meaning is by definition an orthodox Muslim. But now is his coup de grace. Shabastari says, you also, if you don't see within its hidden reality, cannot be counted as a Muslim in the faith, he's now talking to his Muslim brethren, because there are some fanatics even then. Laiji says, since it is established that the idolater's heresy is due to only observing the outer form of the Buddha, you who claim to be a pious Muslim are also an idolater if you only see its outer appearance and you fail to see the supreme reality manifesting in the form of the Buddha. Because you will, have failed your, you will have veiled yourself from the truth by limiting your vision to the statue's entity. You will have, in fact, obs obscured the supreme reality's manifestation through the Buddha's outer form. I mean, it's amazing literature. People try to impose uh, democracy on Muslim cultures and other beliefs, and these guys have the best juice of all because they, they encountered the illness way back. And they found the right medicine way back. See, this is all stuff that just is not, is not published enough. And there's more to come, as you'll see. Talking about these people who will, would have destroyed the Buddha statues, and I say I wouldn't have had time to show you the photos anyway, but you can imagine these, these Buddhas. Uh, I mean, th there's utterly astounding, about 175 feet tall, for the, for the large one. And you walk up and you walk up and up and up and up and up these stairs and you get up to the top. It's just unbelievable. You can, you can go behind and you can come and you look down and, and, it's, and it's scary. It's just, you're so high up. And the other one is about uh, 135 feet tall. 
it's also extremely tall. These are the tallest Buddhas, standing Buddhas in the world. And of course, they were determined to destroy them. And they said, um, idolatry is forbidden in the Islamic faith. And those earlier Muslims, they were not good Muslims. They were profiting from the cash they were getting from tourists coming to see the Buddhas. Or for other reasons, over the years, they were profiting from these idols. And, and we're, we're true Muslims, and we're going to destroy them. And they did. And you guys have probably seen images of these Buddhas, I'm sure. And they're just so amazing. Um, the frescoes, like I said, I was up to them, right up to them. They were just so beautiful. And you can still see them in other parts of the world, but it's just so astounding. Now we're going to turn to a different um, thinker, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end the talk uh, and take some questions. This thinker, is, his name is Khwarazmi. And Khwarazm is uh, Central Asia, beyond north of the Oxus River. And Khwarazmi, like Shabastari, is very concerned about the idolatry in Islam, actually. And so he wants to try to talk with his Muslim brethren about true idolatry and um, true belief or true insight. And let's recall that the Sufis were always more interested in spiritual perception than spiritual or religious conviction. And they saw conviction grounded in the emotion of insecurity, fear, and that this would make people very dangerous indeed. So here's what Khwarazmi says. The Muslim believer who is veiled from seeing reality and who has limited God to the form of his own belief does not actually believe in anything except the divinity of his own fantasy and mental fabrication. Yet the supreme essence abides beyond limitation and definition, even as it appears in all of the forms of existence in conformity with the eternal divine attributes. Therefore, whoever attempts to restrict what is beyond limitation and who rejects any conception of divinity other than his own has only the God he has fabricated as the God of his belief. So there is no difference between the carved idols worshipped as deities by idolaters and the gods fabricated in the constricted minds of those veiled from true reality. This is Khwarazmi writing during the Timurid period two centuries later, writing in Herat, Afghanistan. In another chapter of the same commentary that Khwarazmi is making on the work of another Sufi, Ibn al-Arabi, he writes the following, Khwarazmi does. The only difference between the gods created from believed and carved idols that are worshipped by idolaters is that carved idols are fashioned in this outer world and the gods of belief are internally manufactured through supposition. On a positive note, he wants to talk about idolatry. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's an ambivalence always when it comes to idolatry. You, you become fixed upon the outer form, and you've lost reality. If you take the outer form as the bridge to reality, it is the source of your salvation in any tradition. So. Here, on a, on a more positive note, um, the same writer, Khwarazmi, says, yet nothing in the world, ex excuse me, he's actually commenting on Ibn al-Arabi again. And um, in this case, I'm sticking closer to the language of the Sheikh himself, Sheikh Ibn al-Arabi of Spain, um, who, who is one of the greatest uh, Sufis to have lived, so great that he's called the greatest Sheikh. Yet nothing in the world is worshipped until it is clothed in exaltation and appears at a sublime level in the worshiper's heart. For God has said in the Quran, 
that he is exalted at all levels of existence. So no matter the level of existence, it is God who is in fact exalted in that level. Meaning that he is not limited only to the transcendental level beyond formal existence. This is sort of a, a more positive sense. Um, Rumi, uh, using again this word but, which means Buddha, but writing at a time before Shabastari and coming from a part of the world where there were still Buddhist temples, probably inactive by his day in the 13th century, just prior to the Mongol invasion. But he, he says the following, the tribe, of, the tribe of purity wandering the world, excuse me, O tribe of purity wandering the world, why are you dumbstruck because of an idol? The one you are seeking in this world is you, yourself, if only you'd seek within. But also pointing to the methodology in some parts of the world called tantric, and in Sufism having a very real place of taking the image of the teacher or the image of a theophany and letting that be your guide or cultivating the image in your heart, in your consciousness. And he's saying what you're really looking for is inside, but you may, you may be looking into this as a mirror. Um, my own teacher and the teacher of some of the people sitting here who spoke in this room uh, only two years ago or so, by then, of course, he's not speaking at all about Buddhas. He would have been surprised by my presentation today, uh, although he did help me translate um, the Garden Mystery, so he wouldn't have been completely surprised. And he says, you've illumined your resplendent face, O seductive idol, using the word Buddha again, O seductive Buddha. But for him, it doesn't mean Buddha like we're thinking. It means like an idol. You've again poured wine from the gold-spilling goblet. And um, the last thing I'd like to mention before taking questions is that I, too, was smitten in 1995 when the Treasures of the Mongols was at this show. And I don't know how many of you saw it and how many of you were here. And I had a very strong experience. And it's lucky I don't uh, have the screen to show you this, this Buddha. You might also be mesmerized through the question and answer period. But I don't know if you remember the White Tara. And I think there might be somebody here. I think I see a couple of people that I may have even had this conversation with. But certainly I saw it. There's a friend of ours who's not here tonight. And I went and I had this experience. And, and then later I said to, to this friend and a group of friends, I said, I want you to go look at the whole collection. And I want you to tell me if you see anything especially interesting. I made it absolutely a point not to say anything that it was the White Tara. And I myself would go back at other times to see if I was hallucinating the first time. And every time, like Wyspensky, I was having the same experience with the White Tara. And essentially what happened is that she was coming to life. She was literally coming to life. And I was absolutely, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was like some trick of magic or some trick of the, the and then I, I, I decided that it was both uh, something about my predisposition, uh, uh, some element in myself that was able to, to merge with this, this um, form of the White Tara and that and it was not a hallucination. It was actually a kind of metaphysics in action, you see. It was something that was actually happening. It was a device. And I suspected, in fact, that the artist knew what he was doing. And sure enough, two of those people saw the, the statue becoming vibrant, luminous, etc. I saw her eyes moving. I mean, you know, I'm not going to sound like a loon, but, um, you know, she, uh, the, I mean, I saw her really basically come to life, and I saw it several times. Did anybody, did anybody remember seeing that statue? I see, that, and I don't know what kind of response, uh, yeah, if, if I'm exaggerating or if you had anything similar. But, but, I, but I mention this because, again, I want to come back to the thing I said earlier. The museum is a, is a strange collection of things from all over, and there's a way that it can be a very uh, scattering and, and, um, uh, dissociative experience, just wandering through the museum at random, like somebody wandering through, you know, one of these all-you-can-eat restaurants or something, and then leaving with indigestion. So when I come to the museum, I sort of pick what I'm going to look at. I mean, you have to. 